Michelle Martinka was born on October 6, 1961 in Cedar Rapids in the state of Iowa. She was the youngest of three daughters of Albert and Janet Martingo. In her childhood, she was diagnosed with scoliosis and had to wear a brace that went from her hips to her neck. Due to this, she was a very shy and quiet child and hardly spoke to another children at school. As a teenager, she was described as a normal girl who worried about things related to her age, like school tests, clothes, and boys. Michelle attended Kennedy High School. She was an above-average student and very well regarded by her teachers. It is said that she was a talented artist and she performed in several singing groups and theatrical productions. She was also part of Baton Twirling, a kind of artistic gymnastics. She was in her final year of high school and when she graduated, she had planned to study interior design at Iowa State University. On December 19, 1969, Michelle attended a banquet with her school's musical group. This banquet was held at the Sheraton, a large hotel located in downtown Cedar Rapids. After the banquet, Michelle invited her friend Jane Hansen, who was also at the event, to the Westdale Mall, a mall located in the southwest of the city that had recently opened. Jane said she couldn't go, as she was behind on some homework and she wanted to catch up. Michelle then went alone. She had her father's car, a 1972 Buick, and $180 that she would use to buy a new coat for the winter. She already knew this mall very well, having gotten a job there months before. When she arrived at the place, she left the car in the parking lot and entered the mall. This was around 7 p.m. Inside, she found some friends from school who were also shopping. She chatted with them for a while and then went to the store to buy her coat. That was the last time Michelle Martinka was seen alive. The hours passed and as the young woman didn't return home, her parents were very worried. It was 2 a.m. when Michelle's father decided to call the police and report what had happened. Immediately, the police went looking for the young woman around the city. At around 4 a.m., they found the 1972 Buick vehicle in the corner of the Westdale Mall parking lot. As they approached, they noticed that there was someone inside lying on their back in the passenger seat. When they opened the vehicle door, they found the bloody body of Michelle Martinko. The captain of the detective office at the time, Charles Jelinek, was the one who broke the sad news to the victim's parents. Describing the crime scene, Charles said in his own words, Michelle was wearing a rabbit fur coat and there was bloody rabbit fur all over the car. She was lying on her back, slumped in the passenger seat of the Buick and leaning against the car door. According to the medical examiner, Michelle had 29 punctures in her body, in the region of her face, neck, and chest. These punctures were caused by a sharp object that they couldn't specify precisely. There was also several cuts on her hands and forearms, indicating that she tried to defend herself from the attacker. Michelle was not abused or robbed. For the police, the crime seemed to be of a personal nature, in this case, revenge. The police even made a sweep of the place to see if they could find a weapon used in the crime but they were unsuccessful. There was no blood on the floor of the parking lot or around the vehicle, which indicated that Michelle had been killed inside the car. Also, no fingerprints were found on the vehicle that did not belong to any member of the Martinko family. Thus, the police assumed that the criminal had used gloves to commit the crime, and for him to have thought about it, the crime may have been premeditated. The case of young student Michelle Martinko was reported throughout the local and regional media. The police were looking for answers, and so was the family. Jane Hansen, Michelle's friend who refused to go with her to the mall because of her homework, said she got a call from Michelle's mother at 4.30 in the morning and didn't believe it when she heard the news. She said that she felt guilty for not going with her friend to the mall and that if she had accepted the invitation, maybe Michelle could be alive. Still, according to her, it was a very scary time. Nobody knew who the criminal was and he was still around and could make new victims. It is said that the fear was so great that several women in the city after fulfilling work hours asked the security guards to accompany them to the car. It was clear that this brutal crime not only shocked the city but also caused many to change their routine for fear of being the next victim. In June 1980, the police heard from two alleged witnesses who provided a description of the men believed to be the responsible for the crime. These witnesses were hypnotized so that they could pass on as much detail as possible that would help the police arrest the criminal and solve the case. 
According to them, the man was white, no more than 20 years old, about 6 feet tall and had dark curly hair. A composite sketch of the suspect was made based on this information, as you can see on the screen. Despite having the characteristics of the alleged criminal in hand, the police were unable to reach anyone who could be responsible for the crime. The police then went after a 19-year-old boy named Andy Sido. Andy was an ex-boyfriend of Michelle's. The two dated for two years before she broke up with him. According to the victim's relatives, Andy didn't take this breakup very well. Also according to them, the boy wanted to know where Michelle was going, if she was seeing someone, and who that person was. He also used to question her friends so that they would give him information about the young woman's life. In the course of investigations, officers discovered that Andy Sido was the same mall on the night of the crime and that he had met Michelle there. Andy was taken in for questioning, but he was soon ruled out as a suspect as he had an alibi that proves he was already home at the time of the crime. Although Andy was ruled out by the police as a suspect, many in town believed he was responsible for the crime and his behavior during Michelle's funeral further reinforced the townspeople's suspicions. He barely left the coffin, cried a lot and hugged Michelle's body several times. At one point, he went to a friend of Michelle's and started asking, I need to know who she loved when she died. Did she love me or did she love Mike? Who did she love when she died? On this strange behavior and in the eyes of the man, he was considered a potential suspect. The police had nothing against him. So as I said before, he was ruled out as a suspect. As soon as he graduated from high school, Andy left town and joined the United States Navy. The police also questioned Mike Burek, a college student that Michelle started dating as soon as she separated from Andy. Mike, like Andy, had a relationship with Michelle but they didn't date. He was taken in for questioning and when asked where he was at the time of the crime, he said he was in college. Mike even proved to the cops, but for some reason they thought he was hiding something. The cops were pretty hard on him, they even put crime scene's photo on the interrogation table to intimidate him. According to Mike, seeing those photos was very painful for him. As the officers had nothing substantial against Mike, they released him and ruled out him as a suspect. Time passed and the clues that the police investigated led them nowhere. With no options, they decided to turn to the local community and appeal to the city's residents to provide any information that would help them in the investigation. They also offered a 10,000 reward to anyone who provided real information that would lead them to the criminal. More than 200 people provided information to the police. They investigated all promising leads and interrogated dozens of people using the polygraph. One of these people was a boy who said he followed women around the mall. Some witnesses even said he saw him touching a female mannequins in a strange way. The police investigated this young man and soon ruled him as a suspect. As other than his strange behavior, there was nothing to link him to the crime. Five months after Michelle's death, a woman told the police that in the early hours of December 20, around 2 a.m., she drove her car in front of the parking lot of the mall, where the crime took place, as her daughter's car, who was one working on site, had stayed there because it was broken. As she drove to the parking lot, she said that in addition to her daughter's car, she saw Michelle's Buick 72 with the door open and a man standing by the door. When she learned of the crime, she passed information on to the daughter of the secretary of the commissioner of public safety and believed it would be passed on to the police if it mattered. However, this information never reached the police and they only learned about this months later. Detectives even considered accusing the commissioner of not passing this information on to the police, but no charges were made. Many rumors also surfaced and the police wasted a lot of time investigating as they were going after any information they emerged. Later, the police arrested a man who had broken into a house with a knife and forced a woman to have intimate relations with him by threatening her saying he would kill her children. This crime happened a month before Michel Martico's death, and although he did not involve in the case, he was a potential suspect. However, he was never charged, as the police could not find evidence linking him to the crime. Time passed, and the police ran out of options. They even asked psychics for help, but it was in vain. Until in the mid-80s, the case was shelved. Michel's parents sued the owners of the West Dale Mall, alleging negligence for failing to provide adequate security. The lawsuit ended up in the Iowa State Supreme Court, which ruled in favor of the mall's owners. Michelle's father, Albert Martinko, died in 1995 and her mother, Janet, died in 1998 without anyone knowing who was responsible for her daughter's death. In 2006, more than 25 years after the crime, Cedar Rapids police received new information about the case, which ultimately led them nowhere. However, while one of the detectives was examining all the evidence that was collected at the crime scene, 
He noticed that there was someone else's blood on the dress Michelle was wearing when she was attacked. Later, with the help of DNA tests that did not exist at the time of the crime, he discovered that in addition to the dress, there was also someone else's blood on the tear box of the Buick 72, the vehicle that was with Michelle. It was proven that this blood belonged to a man and that he was certainly responsible for the crime. According to the police, he must have been injured while striking Michelle. The victim's blood must have caused his hand to slip onto the blade, cutting the glove and consequently his hand in the process, thus leaving his blood at the scene of the crime. The DNA was so intact that the analysis was able to conclude that only 1 in 100 billion people would match the DNA profile. Now with that DNA in hand, detectives needed to locate who it belonged to. The police entered the results into CODIS, the United States DNA database that holds the DNA record of thousands of people. However, no DNA matched what they had found. They then decided to test the DNA of all suspects they had interrogated over the years to see if matched the sample they had. In total, 125 men were examined, but the DNA of none of them matched the DNA in the crime scene and the police were once again left with no options. In 2013, more than 30 years after the crime, police received a tape that led them to a potential suspect. However, the suspect's DNA didn't match the DNA found at the crime scene. Also in 2013, Robert Riley, a resident of Cedar Rapids and former student of Kennedy High School, the same school where Michelle studied, created a Facebook group called Michelle Martinko Code Case 1979. In this group, people began to share and discuss information related to the Michelle and the crime. In 2015, more than 35 years after the crime, Detective Matt Dellinger took over the case. Matt is the son of Harvey Dellinger, one of the first detectives to work on Michelle Martinko's case. In May 2017, he contacted Parabon and Labs, a Virginia-based company that provides DNA phenotyping services to law enforcement organizations. Parabon can predict an organism's phenotype including its physical appearance and bionographic ancestry using only the genetic information from the DNA. In short, they were able to know what person is like just by using their DNA. Parabon generated photorealistic illustrations of the criminal through DNA samples taken in 2006. A white man with blonde hair and blue eyes, quite different from the sketch police released in 1980. They included images estimating his appearance in 1979 and also in 2017 with aging effects. The Cedar Rapids Police Department paid $5,000 for the service. In possession of these images, the police had a press conference where they showed the face of the person alleged responsible for the death of Michel Martinko. In the same press conference, they asked that if the population recognized someone resembling the face in the image, it was to contact the police. They also offered 15,000 reward information that would actually help them catch the criminal. In the following weeks, the police received many reports from people claiming to know who the man was. Virtually, every white, blonde, blue-eyed male over 50 who was set foot on the state of Iowa had become a suspect. This ended up harming the police who even checked some of these complaints, which ultimately came to nothing. The following year, at the request of Detective Matt Dellinger, Parabon took the DNA data it had on the criminal and fed it to DeadMatch, a public genetic genealogy website that has been used by law enforcement officers to solve numerous cold cases. One of the most famous was the Joseph of James D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, arrested in 2018 at the age of 72, accused of numerous crimes that terrorized California in the 70s and 80s. Through the DNA data entered in DeadMatch, they were able to locate a woman who was related to the criminal, probably a cousin. The company created a family tree, starting with four pairs of this woman's great-grandparents and reported that the perpetrator was likely descended to one of these couples. The officers spent the next few months using genealogy records, birth records and headstone records to put together a family tree and trace of the perpetrator. A detective contacted members of two branches of the family whose DNA was tested and eliminated those branches as the criminal was not part of them. He then contacted a member of a third branch and DNA test determined that this person was the criminal's cousin, meaning they had the same grandparents. This reduced the number of suspects to three brothers, Kenneth Burns, Jerry Burns, and Donald Burns. One of these three men was responsible for the death of Michelle Martinko. The three were from Manchester, a city also in the state of Iowa that is an hour from Cedar Rapids. Detectives began to keep an eye on them and began trying to collect their DNA without them knowing. Kenneth Burns' DNA they managed to get from a straw he used after having lunch at a restaurant. Donald Burns' DNA they took from a toothbrush he had discarded in the trash. And Jerry Burns they managed to get out of a straw he used to drink a soda at a pizzeria. The three items containing the suspect's DNA were sent for analysis. Kenneth Burns and Donald Burns were clean. Their DNA didn't match the DNA found at the crime scene. But Jerry Burns was an exact match. 
It was clear to the detectives that Jerry Barnes was the man they had been looking for for over 35 years. But who was Jerry Barnes? Jerry was born on December 23rd, 1953, and he was 25 years old at the time of the crime. He grew up in Manchester, Iowa, and graduated in 1972 on West Delaware High School. In 1975, he married Patricia Burns, with whom he had three children. He owned a powder coating company and was also a partner in a truck stop. Jerry was above suspicion. He was seen as a respectable businessman and a family man. But two strange things happened related to Jerry's family. The first that in 2008, his wife Patricia took her own life, and on December 19, 2013, her cousin Brian Burns disappeared and was never found again. Remembering that December 19 is the same day, a month that Michelle Martinko was killed. But as far as is known, Jerry is not related to these two incidents. Detective Mark Dellinger decided to go after Jerry Burns to ask him some questions. According to Matt, he wanted to get a confession and even took a hidden camera for it. On December 19, 2018, exactly 39 years after Michelle Martinko's death, Matt Dellinger met with Jerry Barnes. At first, the detective asked how Jerry was and identified himself as the police. He then asked whether Jerry knew about the Michelle Martinko case and whether he had ever been to Cedar Rapids. Jerry said that he had been to the city but he didn't know about the Michelle Martinko's case. But Jerry mentioned the detective about the case Jody Hustenthrud, journalist who disappeared on June 27, 1995 and was never found. I have this complete case here on the channel, and if you haven't watched, go there after this video. This mention of Joji later made detectives hypothesize that Jerry was also involved in this crime, as the case was never solved. The detective said his DNA was found in the crime scene, but Jerry brushed it off and said he didn't know how it happened. Madelinga realized that Jerry would not confess, but his DNA was found at the crime scene, already rented in arrest. The officers also searched Jerry's personal computer and they found some disturbing things. He was fixated on seeing blonde women suffering in the worst possible ways, something extremely sickening. Jerry was then arrested and taken into custody at Cedar Rapids. According to Detective Matt Dellinger, he didn't show any reaction, he kept cool the whole time if he didn't care. The news of Jerry Burns' arrest caused quite a stir in the city of Cedar Rapids. Finally, the person responsible for the death of Michelle Martinko was arrested 39 years after the crime. Relatives and friends of the victim celebrated the fact as many still didn't believe it was real. The name of the group on Facebook, Michelle Martinko Code Case 1979, was changed to Michelle Martinko 1961 to 1979, the year of birth and death of the young woman. Since the previous name referred to an unsolved case, which was now being solved. On February 12, 2020, Jerry Burns' trial began. Michelle Martinko's family and friends were present, including Andy Sato, the ex boyfriend of the young woman who many believe was responsible for the crime. During the trial, the prosecution emphasized that it was unlikely that the DNA found in the crime scene was from anyone other than Jerry Barnes. The dress Michelle Martinko wore the night of the crime was presented to the jury. It had markings on the places that were pierced when she was attacked. The defense argued that the DNA evidence was compromised and different pieces of clothing from the crime scene should not have been stored together in the evidence bag. The defense also brought a forensic DNA consultant who spoke about the possibility that the police had stored evidence incorrectly. He claimed that Jerry Burns' DNA could be in place to the secondary transfer, arguing skin cells can be transferred to an item of clothing when a person pumps into another. However, it was proven that there was blood from the defendant on the victim's dress and car, that it was certainly not because of a bump. According to the police, Jerry Burns didn't know Michelle Martinko. As far as it's known, he followed her and killed her for no apparent reason. Detectives investigate the possibility that he's a serial killer and that he may have killed other women. Jerry Burns' daughter Jennifer and her brother Donald said in an interview that they couldn't believe the man they knew and loved so much was capable of such a horrible act. Michelle Martinko's older sister Janelle and husband, John Stonebreaker, said they were thrilled to have the case resolved. According to them, they had already given up hope and did not believe that the criminal would one day be caught. Other family members and friends of the victim felt the same way and were very relieved when the case was finally resolved. Although the crime took place in 1979, more than 40 years ago, many in the city still remember the incident. A young girl who was still in high school was brutally killed in the parking lot of a busy mall and no one saw anything. For many, this left a scar in the city's history that is unlikely to be erased. On August 7, 2020, Jerry Burns was found guilty in the first degree murder of Michelle Martinko. He was sentenced in life to prison without parole. Today he is serving his sentence at Anamosa State Prison where he still spends the rest of his days. Well folks, that's it, thank you so much for watching until the end, best wishes and I see you next time.